Chapter sixty one of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter sixty one. Bad news from home and worse on board. Notwithstanding his previous trials, Peter forced to prepare for another mrs trotter again improves as she grows old captain hawkins and his twelve charges no other event of consequence occurred until we joined the admiral who only detained us three hours with the fleet and then sent us home with his dispatches we arrived after a quiet passage at portsmouth where i wrote immediately to my sister ellen requesting to know the state of my father's health i waited impatiently for an answer and by return of post received one with a black seal my father had died the day before from a brain fever and ellen conjured me to obtain leave of absence to come to her in her state of distress the captain came on board the next morning and i had a letter ready written on service to the admiral stating the circumstances and requesting leave of absence i presented it to him and entreated him to forward it at any other time i would not have condescended but the thoughts of my poor sister unprotected and alone and my father lying dead in the house made me humble and submissive captain hawkins read the letter and very coolly replied that it was very easy to say that my father was dead but he required proofs even this insult did not affect me i put my sister's letter in his hand he read it and as he returned it to me he smiled maliciously it is impossible for me to forward your letter mr simple as i have one to deliver to you he put a large folio packet into my hand and went below i opened it it was a copy of a letter demanding a court-martial upon me with a long list of the charges preferred by him i was stupefied not so much at his asking for a court-martial but at the conviction of the impossibility of my now being able to go to the assistance of my poor sister i went down into the gun-room and threw myself on a chair at the same time tossing the letter to thompson the master he read it over carefully and folded it up upon my word simple i do not see that you have much to fear these charges are very frivolous the next morning the official letter from the port admiral came off acquainting me that a court-martial had been ordered upon me and that it would take place that day week i immediately resigned the command to the second lieutenant and commenced an examination into the charges preferred they were very numerous and dated back almost to the very day that he had joined the ship there were twelve in all i shall not trouble the reader with the whole of them as many were very frivolous the principal charges were one for mutinous and disrespectful conduct to captain hawkins on such a date having in a conversation with an inferior officer on the quarter-deck stated that captain hawkins was a spy and had spies in the ship two for neglect of duty in disobeying the orders of captain hawkins on the night of the dash of dash three for having on the dash of dash sent away two boats from the ship in direct opposition to the orders of captain hawkins four for having again on the morning of the dash of dash held mutinous and disrespectful conversation relative to captain hawkins with the gunner of the ship allowing the latter to accuse captain hawkins of cowardice without reporting the same five for insulting expressions on the quarter-deck to captain hawkins on his rejoining the brig on the morning of dash of dash six for not causing the orders of captain hawkins 
to be put in force on several occasions etc 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 and further as captain hawkins testimony was necessary in two of the charges the king on those charges was the prosecutor two days before my court-martial i received a letter from ellen who appeared in a state of distraction from this accumulation of misfortune she told me that my father was to be buried the next day and that the new rector had written to her to know when it would be convenient for the vicarage to be given up that my father's bills had been sent in and amounted to twelve hundred pounds already and that she knew not the extent of the whole claims there appeared to be nothing left but the furniture of the house and she wanted to know whether the debts were to be paid with the money i had left in the funds for her use i wrote immediately requesting her to liquidate every claim as far as my money went sending her an order upon my agent to draw for the whole amount and a power of attorney to him to sell out the stock i had just sealed the letter when mrs trotter who had attended the ship since our return to portsmouth begged to speak with me and walked in after her message without waiting for an answer my dear mr simple said she i know all that is going on and i find that you have no lawyer to assist you now i know that it is necessary and will very probably be of great service in your defence for when people are in distress and anxiety they have not their wits about them so i have brought a friend of mine from port sea a very clever man who for my sake will undertake your cause and i hope you will not refuse him you recollect giving me a dozen pair of stockings i did not refuse them nor shall you refuse me now mr trotter's advice was good and although i would not listen to receiving his services gratuitously I agreed to employ him and very useful did he prove against such charges and such a man as captain hawkins he came on board that afternoon carefully examined into all the documents and the witnesses whom i could bring forward showed me the weak side of my defence and took the papers on shore with him every day he came on board to collect fresh evidence and examine into my case at last the day arrived i dressed myself in my best uniform the gun fired from the admiral's ship with the signal for a court-martial at nine o'clock and i went on board in a boat with all the witnesses on my arrival i was put under the custody of the provost-marshal the captains ordered to attend pulled alongside one after another and were received by a party of marines presenting their arms at half past nine the court was all assembled and i was ushered in court-martials are open courts although no one is permitted to print the evidence at the head of the long table was the admiral as president on his right hand standing was captain hawkins as prosecutor on each side of the table were six captains sitting near to the admiral according to their seniority at the bottom facing the admiral was the judge advocate on whose left hand i stood as prisoner the court were all sworn and then took their seats stanchions with ropes covered with green baize passed along were behind the chairs of the captains who composed the court so that they might not be crowded upon by those who came in to listen to what passed the charges were then read as well as the letters to and from the admiral by which the court-martial was demanded and granted and then captain hawkins was desired to open his prosecution he commenced with observing his great regret that he had been forced to a measure so repugnant to his feelings his frequent cautions to me and the indifference with which i treated them and after a preamble composed of every falsity that could be devised he commenced with the first charge and stating himself to be the witness gave his evidence i wish 
said the second captain who was addressed to ask captain hawkins whether when he came on deck he came up in the usual way in which a captain of a man of war comes on his quarter-deck or whether he slipped up without noise captain hawkins declared that he came up as he usually did this was true enough for he invariably came up by stealth but captain hawkins do you not think allowing that you came up on deck in your usual way as you term it that you would have done better to have hemmed or hawed so as to let your officers know that you were present i should be very sorry to hear all that might be said of me in my supposed absence to this observation captain hawkins replied that was so astonished at the conversation that he was quite breathless having till then had the highest opinion of me no more questions were asked and they proceeded to the second charge this was a very trifling one for lighting a stove contrary to orders the evidence brought forward was the sergeant of marines when his evidence in favor of the charge had been given the following questions were put by some of the members of the court you have served in other ships before yes did you ever sailing with other captains receive an order from them to report direct to them and not through the first lieutenant the witness here prevaricated answered directly yes or no no the third charge was then brought forward for sending away boats contrary to express orders this was substantiated by captain hawkins own evidence the order having been verbal by the advice of my counsel i put no questions to captain hawkins neither did the court the fourth charge that of holding mutinous conversation with the gunner and allowing him to accuse the captain of unwillingness to engage the enemy was then again substantiated by captain hawkins as the only witness i again left my reply for my defence and one only question was put by one of the members which was to inquire of captain hawkins as he appeared peculiarly unfortunate in overhearing conversations whether he walked up as usual to the taffrail or whether he crept up captain hawkins gave the same answer as before the fifth charge for insulting expressions to captain hawkins on my rejoining the brig at carl's krona was then brought forward and the sergeant of marines one of the seamen appeared as witnesses this charge excited a great deal of amusement in the cross-examination by the members of the court captain hawkins was asked what he meant by the expression when disposing of the clothes of an officer who was killed in action that the men appeared to think that his trousers would instill fear nothing more upon my honor sir replied captain hawkins than an implication that they were alarmed lest they should be haunted by his ghost then of course mr simple meant the same in his reply observed the captain sarcastically the remainder of the charges were then brought forward but they were of little consequence end of chapter sixty one recording by john brandon chapter sixty two of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anthony gerges peter simple by frederick marriott chapter sixty two a good defence not always good against a bad accusation peter wins the hearts of the judges yet loses his cause and has dismissed his ship the next day i commenced my defence i preferred calling my own witnesses first and by the advice of my counsel and at the request of swinburne i called him i put the following questions when we were talking on the quarter-deck was it fine weather uh, yes it was do you think that you might have heard any one coming on deck in the usual way up the companion ladder uh, sure of it do you mean then to imply that captain hawkins came up stealthily i have an idea he pounced on us as a cat does a mouse 
What were the expressions made use of? I said that a spy captain would always find spy followers. In that remark, were you and Mr. Simple referring to your own captain? The remark was mine. What Mr. Simple was thinking of, I can't tell. But I did refer to the captain, and he has proved that I was right. This bold answer of Swinburne's rather astonished the court, who commenced cross-questioning him. But he kept to his original assertion that I had only answered generally. To repel the second charge, I produced two witnesses, but to the third charge, I brought forward three witnesses to prove that Captain Hawkins's orders were that I should send no boats on shore, not that I should not send them on board of the men of war close to us. In answer to the fourth charge, I called Swinburne, who stated that if I did not, he would come forward. Swinburne acknowledged that I had accused the captain of being shy, and that I reprimanded him for so doing. Did he say that he would report you? inquired one of the captains. Uh, no, sir, replied Swinburne, because he uh, never meant to do it. This was an unfortunate answer. To the fifth charge, I brought several witnesses to prove the words of Captain Hawkins, and the sense in which they were taken up by the ship's company, and the men calling out shame when he used the expression. To refute the other charges, I called one or two witnesses, and the court then adjourned, inquiring of me when I should be ready to commence my defense. I requested a day to prepare, which was readily granted, and the ensuing day the court did not sit. I hardly need say that I was busily employed arranging my defense with the council. At last, all was done, and I went to bed tired and unhappy, but I slept soundly, which could not be said of my counsel, for he went on shore at eleven o'clock and sat up all night arranging and making a fair copy. After all, the fairest court of justice is a naval court-martial. No browbeating of witnesses, an evident inclination towards the prisoner, every allowance and every favor granted him, and no legal quibbles to attend to. It is a court of equity with very few exceptions, and the humbler the individual, the greater chance in his favor. I was awoke the following morning by my counsel, who had not gone to bed the previous night, and would come off at seven o'clock to read over with me my defense. At nine o'clock, I again proceeded on board, and in a short time the court was sitting. I came in, handed my defense to the judge advocate, who read it aloud to the court. I have a copy still by me, and will give the whole of it to the reader. Mr. President and Gentlemen, after nearly fourteen years of service in his majesty's naval duty during which i have been twice made prisoner twice wounded and once wrecked and as i trust i shall prove to you by certificates in the public dispatches i have done my duty with zeal and honour i now find myself in a situation in which i never expected to be placed that of being arraigned before and brought to a court-martial for charges of mutiny disaffection and disrespect towards my superior officer if the honorable court will examine the certificates i am about to produce they will find that until i sailed with captain hawkins my conduct has always been supposed to have been diametrically opposite to that which is now imputed to me i have always been diligent and obedient to command and i have only to regret that the captains with whom i have had the honor to sail are not now present to corroborate by their oral evidence the truth of these documents Allow me in the first place to point out to the court that the charges against me are spread over a large space of time, amounting to nearly eighteen months, during the whole of which period Captain Hawkins never stated to me once that it was his intention to try me by a court-martial, and, although repeatedly in the presence of a senior officer, he never preferred any charge against me. The Articles of War state expressly that if any officer, soldier, or marine has any complaint to make, he is to do so upon his arrival at any port or fleet where he may fall in with a superior officer. I admit that this article of war refers to complaints to be made by inferiors against superiors, but at the same time I venture to submit to the honorable court that a superior is equally bound to prefer a charge or to give notice that the charge will be preferred on the first seasonable opportunity. Instead of lulling the offender into security and disarming him in his defense, by allowing the time to run on so long so as to render him incapable of bringing forward his witnesses, I take the liberty of calling this to your attention, and shall now proceed to answer the charges which have been brought against me. I am accused of having held a conversation with an inferior officer on the quarter-deck of His Majesty's brig Rattlesnake, in which my captain was treated with contempt, that it may not be supposed that Mr. Swinburne was an acquaintance, made upon my joining of the brig. I must observe that he was an old shipmate with whom I served many years, and with whose worth I was well acquainted. He was my instructor in my more youthful days, and has been awarded for his merit with the warrant which he now holds as gunner of His Majesty's brig Rattlesnake. The offence observation in the first place was not mine, and in the second it was couched in general terms. Here Mr. Swinburne has pointedly confessed that he did refer to the captain, although the observation was in the plural, but that does not prove the charge against me. 
on the contrary adds weight to the assertion of mr swinburne that i was guiltless of the present charges that captain hawkins had acted as a spy his own evidence on this charge as well as what was brought forward by other witnesses will decidedly prove but as the truth of the observation does not warrant its utterance i am glad that no such expression escaped my lips upon the second charge i shall dwell but a short time it is true that there is a general order that no stove shall be alight after a certain hour but i will appeal to the honourable court whether a first lieutenant is not considered to have a degree of license of judgment in all that concerns the interior discipline of the ship the surgeon sent to say that a stove was required for one of the sick i was in bed at the time and replied immediately in the affirmative does captain hawkins mean to assert to the honourable court they would have refused the request of the surgeon most certainly not the only error i committed if it was an error was not going through the form of awakening captain hawkins to ask the permission which as first lieutenant i thought myself authorized to give the charge against me of having sent away two boats contrary to his order i have already disproved by witnesses the order of captain hawkins was not to communicate with the shore my regions for sending away the boats here captain hawkins interposed and stated to the president that my reasons were not necessary to be received the court was cleared and on our return the court had decided that my reasons ought to be given and i continued my reasons for sending away these boats or rather it was one boat which was dispatched to the two frigates if i remember well were that the brig was in a state of mutiny the captain had tied up one of my men and the ship's company refused to be flogged captain hawkins then went ashore to the admiral to report the situation of his ship and i conceived it my duty to make it known to the men of war anchored close to us i shall not enter into further particulars as they will only disdain the honourable court and i am aware that this court-martial is held upon my conduct and not upon that of captain hawkins to the charge of again holding disrespectful language on the quarter-deck as overheard by captain hawkins i must refer the honourable court to the evidence in which it is plainly proved that their marks upon him were not mine but those of mr swinburne and that i remonstrated with mr swinburne for using such unguarded expressions the only point of difficulty is whether it was not my duty to have reported such language i reply that there is no proof that i did not intend to report it but the presence of captain hawkins who heard what was said rendered such report unnecessary on the fifth charge i must beg the court will be pleased to consider that some allowance ought to be made for a moment of irritation my character was traduced by captain hawkins supposing that i was dead so much so that even the ship's company cried out shame i am aware that no language of a superior officer can warrant a retort from the inferior but as what i was intended to imply by the language is not yet known although captain hawkins has given an explanation to his i shall merely say that i meant no more by my insinuations than captain hawkins did at the time by those which he made use of with respect to me upon the other trifling charges brought forward i lay no stress as i consider them fully refuted by the evidence which has already been adduced and i shall merely observe that for reasons best known to himself i have been met with a most decided hostility on the part of captain hawkins from the time that he first joined the ship that on every occasion he used all his efforts to render me uncomfortable and embroil me with others that not content with narrowly watching my conduct on board he has resorted to using his spy-glass from the shore and instead of assisting me in the execution of a duty sufficiently arduous he has thrown every obstacle in my way placed inferior officers as spies over my conduct and made me feel so humiliated in the presence of the ship's company over which i had superintended and in the disciplining of which i had a right to look to him for support that were it not that some odium would necessarily be attached to the sentence i should feel as if one of the happiest events of my life that i were dismissed from the situation which i now hold under his command i now beg that the honourable court will allow the documents i lay upon the table to be read in support of my character when this was over the court was cleared that they might decide upon the sentence i waited about half an hour in the greatest anxiety when i was again summoned to attend the usual forms of reading the papers were gone through and then came the sentence which was read by the president he and the whole court standing up with their cocked hats on their heads after the pre-ramble it concluded with saying that it was the opinion of the court that the charges had been partly proved and therefore the lieutenant peter simple was dismissed his ship but in consideration of his good character and services his case was strongly recommended to the consideration of the lord's commissioners of the admiralty End of chapter sixty two chapter sixty three of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 63. Peter looks upon his loss as something gained, goes on board the rattlesnake to pack up, and is ordered to pack off. Polite leave-taking between relations. Mrs. Trotter better and better. Goes to London and afterwards falls into all manner of misfortune by the hands of robbers and his own uncle. I hardly knew whether I felt glad or sorry at this sentence. On the one hand, it was almost a death-blow to my future advancement or employment in the service. On the other, the recommendation very much softened down the sentence, and I was quite happy to be quit of Captain Hawkins and free to hasten to my poor sister. I bowed respectfully to the court, which immediately adjourned. Captain Hawkins followed the captains on the quarter-deck, but none of them would speak to him, so much to his disadvantage had come out during the trial. About ten minutes afterwards, one of the elder captains, composing the court, called me into the cabin. Mr. Simple, said he, we are all very sorry for you. Our sentence could not be more lenient under the circumstances. It was that conversation with the gunner at the Tarfall which floored you. It must be a warning to you to be more careful in the future how you permit anyone to speak on the conduct of your superiors on the quarter-deck. I am desired by the President to let you know that it is our intention to express ourselves very strongly to the Admiral in your behalf so much so that if another captain applies for you you will have no difficulty in being appointed to a ship and as for leaving your present ship under any other circumstances i should consider it a matter of congratulation i returned my sincere thanks and soon afterwards quitted the guard ship and went on board of the brig to pack up my clothes and take leave of my messmates on my arrival i found that captain hawkins had preceded me and he was on deck when i came up on the side i hastened down into the gunroom where i received the condolments of my messmates simple i wish you joy cried thompson loud enough for the captain to hear on deck i wish i had your luck i wish somebody would try me by a court-martial as it has turned out replied i in a loud voice and after the communication made to me by the captains composing the court of what they intended to say to the admiralty i agree with you thompson that it is a very kind act on the part of captain hawkins i feel quite grateful to him steward come glasses cried thompson let us drink success to mr simple all this was very annoying to Captain Hawkins, who overheard every word. When our glasses were filled, Simple, your good health, and may I meet with as good a messmate, said Thompson. At this moment, the sergeant of the Marines put his head in the gunroom and said, in the most insolent tone, that I was to leave the ship immediately. I was so irritated that I threw my glass of grog in his face, and he ran up to the captain to make the complaint, but I did not belong to the ship, and even if I had, I would have resented such impertinence. Captain Hawkins was in a great rage, and I believe you would have written for another court-martial, but he had had enough of them. He inquired very particularly of the sergeant whether he had told me that I was to leave the ship directly, or whether the Captain Hawkins desired that I should leave the ship immediately, and find that he had not given the latter message which I was aware of, for had he given it, I dared not have acted as I did. He then sent down again by one of the midshipsmen, desiring me to leave the ship immediately." My reply was that I should certainly obey his orders with the greatest pleasure. I hastened to pack my clothes, reported myself ready to the second lieutenant, who went up for permission to man the boat, which was refused by Captain Hawkins, who said I might go on shore in a shore boat. I called one alongside, shook hands with all my messmates, and when I arrived on the quarter deck with Swinburne and some of the best men who came forward, Captain Hawkins stood by the binnacle bursting with rage. As I went over to the plains here, I took my hat off to him, and I wished him good morning very respectfully, adding, If you have any commands for my uncle, Captain Hawkins, I shall be glad to execute them. This observation, which showed him that I knew the connection and correspondence between them, made him gasp with emotion. Leave the ship, sir, or by God I'll put you in irons for mutiny, cried he. I again took off my hat, and went down the side and shoved off. As soon as I was a few yards distance, the men jumped on the carronade and cheered, and I perceived Captain Hawkins order them down, and before I was a cable length from her, the pipe, all hands to punishment. So I presume some of the poor fellows suffered for their insubordination in showing their good will. I acknowledged that I might have left the ship in a more dignified manner, and that my conduct was not altogether correct. But still, I state what I really did do, and some allowance must be made for my feelings. This is certain that my conduct after the court-martial was more deserving of punishment than that which I had been tried. But I was in a state of feverish excitement, and I hardly knew what I did. When I arrived at Sally Port, I had my effects wheeled up on the blue posts, and packing up with those I most required, I threw off my uniform, which was once more a gentlemanly large. I took my place in the mail for that evening, sent a letter of thanks, 
with a few banknotes to my counsel, and then sat down and wrote a long letter to O'Brien, acquainting him with the events which had taken place. I had just finished and sealed it up, when in came Mrs. Trotter. "'Oh, my dear Mr. Simple, I am so sorry. I have come to console you. There is nothing like a woman where men are in affliction, as poor Mr. Trotter used to say, as he laid his head in my lap. When do you go to town?' this evening mrs trotter i hope i am continued to attend the ship i hope so too mrs trotter i have no doubt but you will now mr simple how are you off for money do you want a little you can pay me by and by don't be afraid i'm not quite so poor as i was when you came down to mess with trotter and me and when you gave me a dozen pair of stockings i know what it is to want money and what it is to want friends many thanks to you mrs trotter replied i but i have sufficient to take me home and then I can obtain more. Well, I'm glad of it, but it was offered in earnest. Good-bye. God bless you. Come, Mr. Simple, give me a kiss. It won't be the first time. I kissed her, for I felt grateful for her kindness, and with a little smirking and oogling, she quitted the room. I could not help thinking, after she was gone, how little we knew the hearts of others. If I had been asked if Mrs. Trotter was a person to have done a generous action, from what I have seen of her in adversity, I should have decidedly said no. Yet in this offer she was disinterested, for she knew the service well enough to be aware that I had little chance of being a first lieutenant again, and of being of service to her. And how often does it also occur that those who ought, from gratitude or long friendship, to do all they can to assist you, turn from you in your necessity, and prove false and treacherous? It is God alone who knows our hearts. I sent my letter to O'Brien to the Admiral's office, sat down to a dinner which I could not taste, and at seven o'clock got into the mail. I was very ill, I had a burning fever and a dreadful headache, but I thought only of my sister. When I arrived in town I was much worse, but did not wait more than an hour. I took my place in a coach which should not go to the town near which we resided, for I had inquired and found the coach was full, and I did not choose to wait another day. The coach in which I took my place went within forty miles of the vicarage, and I intended to post across the country. The next evening I arrived at the point of separation and taking out my portmanteau, ordered a chase, and set off for what had once been my home. I could hardly hold my head up, I was so ill, and I lay in the corner of the chase, in a sort of dream, kept from sleeping by intense pain in the forehead and temples. It was about nine o'clock at night, when we were in a dreadful jolting road. The shocks proceeded from which gave me agonizing pain, and the chase was stopped by two men, who dragged me out onto the grass. One stood over me, while the other rifled the chase. The postboy, who appeared a party to the transaction, remained quietly on the horse, and as soon as they had taken my effects, turned round and drove me off. They then rifled my person, taking away everything that I had, leaving me nothing but my trousers and shirt. After a short consultation, they ordered me to walk in on the direction which they had been proceeding in the chase, and to hasten as fast as I could, or as they would blow my brains out. I complied with their request, thinking myself fortunate to have escaped so well. I knew that I was still thirty miles at least from the vicarage, but ill as I was, I hoped to be able to reach it on foot. I walked during the remainder of the night, but I got on but slowly. I reeled from one side of the road to the other, and occasionally sat down to rest. Morning dawned, and I perceived habitations not far from me. I staggered on in my course. The fever now raged in me, my head was splitting with agony, and I trotted to a bank near a small neat cottage on the side of the road. I have a faint recollection of someone coming to me and taking my hand, but nothing further, and it was not till many months afterwards that I became acquainted with the circumstances which I now relate. It appears that the owner of the cottage was a half-pay lieutenant in the army who had sold out on account of his wounds. I was humanely taken to his house, laid on a bed, and a surgeon requested to come to me immediately. I had now lost all recollection, and who I was they could not ascertain. My pockets were empty, and it was only by the mark of my linen that they found out that my name was Simple. For three weeks I remained in a state of alternate stupor and delirium. When the latter came on, I raved of Lord Privilege, O'Brien, and Celeste. Mr. Selwyn, the officer who was so kindly assisted me, knew that Simple was a patronymic name of Lord Privilege, and he immediately wrote to his lordship stating that a young man of the name of Simple, who, in his delirium, called upon him, and Captain O'Brien was lying in a most dangerous state in his house, and that, as he presumed, I was a relative of his lordship, he had deemed it right to appraise him of the fact. My uncle, who knew that it must be me, thought this too favorable an opportunity, provided I should live, not to have me in his power. He wrote to say that he would be there in a day or two. 
at the same time thanking mr selwyn for his attention to his poor nephew and requesting that no expense might be spared but when my uncle arrived which he did in his own chariot the crisis of the fever was over but i was still in a state of stupor arising from extreme debility he thanked mr selwyn for his attention which he said he was afraid was of little avail as i was every year becoming more deranged and he expressed his fears that it would terminate in chronic lunacy his poor father died in the same state continued my uncle passing his hand across my eyes as if much affected i have brought my physician with me to see if he can be moved i shall not be satisfied unless i am with him night and day the physician who was my uncle's valet took me by the hand felt my pulse examined my eyes and pronounced that it would be very easy to move me and that i should recover sooner in a more airy room of course mr selwyn raised no objection putting down all to my uncle's regard for me and my clothes were put on me as i lay in a state of insensibility and i was lifted into the chariot as it is more wonderful that i did not die from being taken out of bed in such a state but it pleased heaven that it should be otherwise had such an event taken place it would probably have pleased my uncle much better than my surviving when i was in the carriage supported by the pseudo physician my uncle again thanked mr selwyn begged that he would command his interest wrote a handsome check for the surgeon who had attended me and getting into the carriage drove off with me in a state of insensibility that is i was not so sensible but i think i felt i had been removed and i heard the rattling of the wheels but my mind was so uncollected that i was in a state of such weakness that i could not feel assured of it for a minute for some days after for i recollect nothing about the journey i found myself in bed in a dark room and my arms confined i recalled my senses and by degrees was able to recollect all that had occurred until i lay down by the roadside where was i the room was dark i could distinguish nothing that i had attempted to do myself some injury i took for granted or my own arms would have been secured i had been in a fever and delirious i suppose and had now recovered i had been in a reverie for more than an hour wondering why i was left alone when the door of the apartment opened who's there inquired i oh you've come to yourself again said a gruff voice then i'll give you a little daylight he took down the shutter which covered the whole of the window and a flood of light poured in which blinded me i shut my eyes and by degrees admitted the light until i could bear it i looked at the apartment the walls were bare and whitewashed i was on a truckle bed i looked at the window it was closed up with iron bars why where am i inquired i of the man with alarm where are you replied he why in bed lamb End of chapter 63「sixty four of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gurgis. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter sixty four. As O'Brien said, it's a long lane that has no turning. I am rescued, and happiness pours in upon me as fast as misery before overwhelmed me the shock was too great i fell back on my pillow insensible how long i lay i know not but when i recovered the keeper was gone and i found a jug of water and some bread by the side of the bed i drank the water and the effect it had upon me was surprising i felt that i could get up and i rose my arms had been unpinioned during my swoon it was about noon that the medical people attended by the keepers and others came into my apartment is he quite quiet oh lord yes sir as quiet as a lamb replied the man who had before entered i then spoke to the medical gentleman betting him to tell me why and how i had been brought here he answered mildly and soothingly saying that i was there at the wish of my friends and that every care would be taken of me that he was aware that my paroxysms were only occasional and that during the time that i was quiet i should have every indulgence that i could be granted and that he hoped that i should be perfectly well and be permitted to leave the hospital i replied by stating who i was and how i had been taken ill the doctor shook his head advised me to lie down as much as possible and then quitted me to visit the other patients as i afterwards discovered my uncle had had me confined upon the plea that i was a young man who was deranged with the idea that his name was simple and that he was the heir to the title and estates that i was very troublesome at times forcing my way into his house and insulting the servants but in every other respect was harmless that my paroxysms generally ended in a violent fever and that it was more from the fear of my coming to some harm than from any ill will towards the poor young man that he wished me to remain in the hospital and be taken care of the reader may at once perceive the art of this communication 
I, having no idea why I was confined, would of course soon continue to style myself by my true name, and as long as I did this, so long would I be considered in a deranged state. The reader must not therefore be surprised when I tell him that I remained in Bedlam for one year and eight months. The doctor called upon me for two or three days, and finding me quiet, ordered me to be allowed books, paper, and ink to amuse myself. But every attempt at explanation was certain to be the signal for him to leave my apartment. I found, therefore, not only by him, but from my keeper, who paid no attention to anything I said, that I had no chance of being listened to or obtaining my release. After the first month, the doctor came to me no more. I was a quiet patient, and he received the report of the keeper. I was sent there with every necessary document to prove that I was mad, and although a very little may establish a case of lunacy, it requires something very strong indeed to prove that you are in your right senses. In Bedlam, I found it impossible. At the same time, I was well treated, was allowed all necessary comforts and such amusements as could be obtained from books, etc. I had no reason to complain of the keeper, except that he was too much employed to waste his time in listening to what he did not believe. I wrote several letters to my sister and to O'Brien during the first two or three months and requested that the keeper put them in the post. This he promised to do, never refusing to take the letters, but, as I afterwards found out, they were invariably destroyed. Yet I still bore up with the hopes of release for some time, but the anxiety relative to my sister, when I thought of her situation, my thoughts of Celeste and O'Brien, sometimes quite overcame me. Then indeed I would almost become frantic, and the keeper would report that I had a paroxysm. After six months I became melancholy, and I wasted away. I no longer attempted to amuse myself, but sat all day with my eyes fixed upon vacancy. I no longer attended to my person. I allowed my beard to grow. My face was never washed unless mechanically when ordered by the keeper, and if I was not mad, there was every prospect of my soon becoming so. Life passed away as a blank. I had become indifferent to everything. I noted time no more. The change of seasons was unperceived. Even the day and the night followed without my regarding them. I was in this unfortunate situation when one day the door was opened, and as had been by the custom during my imprisonment, visitors were going round the establishment to indulge their curiosity in witnessing the degradation of their fellow creatures or to offer their commiseration. I paid no heed to them, not even casting up my eyes. This young man, said the medical gentleman who accompanied the party, has entertained the strange idea that his name is Simple, and that he is the rightful heir to the title and property of Lord Privilege. One of the visitors came up to me and looked me in the face. And so he is, cried he to the doctor, who was looked with astonishment. Peter, don't you know me? I started up. It was General O'Brien. I flew into his arms and burst into tears. Sir, said General O'Brien, leading me to the chair and seating me upon it, I tell you that it is Mr. Simple, the nephew of Lord Privilege, and, I believe, the heir to the title. If, therefore, his assertion of such being the case is the only proof of his insanity, then he is illegally confined. I am here, a foreigner, and a prisoner on parole, but I am not without friends, my Lord Belmore, said he, turning to another one of the visitors who had accompanied him. I pledge you my honor that I state is true, and I request you immediately demand the release of this poor young man. I assure you, sir, that I have Lord Privilege's letter, observed the doctor. Lord Privilege is a scoundrel, replied General O'Brien, but there is justice to be obtained in this country, and he shall pay dearly for his lettre de cachet. My dear Peter, how fortunate was my visit to this horrid place! I have heard so much of the excellent arrangements of this establishment that I agreed to walk around with Lord Belmore, but I find that it is abused. Indeed, General O'Brien, I have been treated with kindness, replied I, and particularly by this gentleman. It was not his fault. General O'Brien and Lord Belmore then inquired of the doctor if he had any objection to my release. None whatever, my lord, even if he was insane, although I see now that I have been imposed upon. We allow the friends of any patient to remove him, if they think that they can pay him more attention. He may leave with you this moment. I now did feel my brain turn with the revulsion from despair to hope, and I fell back to my seat. The doctor, perceiving my condition, bled me copiously and laid me on the bed where I remained more than an hour watched by General O'Brien. I then got up, calm and thankful. I was shaved by the barber of the establishment, washed and dressed myself, and leaning on the general's arm, was let out. I cast my eyes upon two celebrated stone figures of melancholy and raging madness as I passed them. I trembled and clung more tightly to the general's arm, was assisted into the carriage, and bade farewell to madness and misery. The general said nothing until we approached the hotel where he resided in Dover Street, and then he inquired in a low voice whether I could bear more excitement. Is it Celeste you mean, general? It is, my dear boy. She is here, and he squeezed my hand. 
alas cried i what hopes have i now of celeste more than you had before replied the general she lives but for you and if you are a beggar i have a competence to make you sufficiently comfortable i returned the general's pressure of the hand but could not speak we descended and in a minute i was led by the father into the arms of the astonished and delighted daughter i must pass over a few days during which i almost recovered my health and spirits and had narrated my adventures to general o'brien and celeste my first object was to discover my sister what had become of poor ellen in the destitute condition in which she had been left i knew not and i resolved to go down to the vicarage and make inquiries i did not however set off until a legal adviser had been sent for by general o'brien and due notice given to lord privilege of an action to be immediately brought against him for false imprisonment i set off in the mail and the next evening arrived in the town of blank i hastened to the parsonage and the tears stood in my eyes as i thought of my mother my poor father and the peculiar and doubtful situation of my dear sister i was answered by a boy in livery and found the present incumbent at home he received me politely listened to my story and then replied that my sister had set off for london on the day of his arrival and that she had not communicated her intentions to any one he then was all clue lost and i was in despair I walked to the town in time to throw myself into the mail, and the next evening joined Celeste and the general, to whom I communicated the unpleasant intelligence, and requested advice how to proceed. Lord Belmore called the next morning, and the general consulted him. His lordship took great interest in my concerns, and previous to any further steps, advised me to step into his carriage, and allow him to relate my case to the first lord of the admiralty. This was done immediately, and as I had now the opportunity of speaking freely to his lordship, I explained to him the conduct of Captain Hawkins and his connection with my uncle, also the reason of my uncle's persecution. His lordship, finding me under such powerful protection as Lord Belmore, and having eye to my future claims which my uncle's conduct gave him reason to suppose were well founded, was extremely gracious, and said that I should hear from him in a day or two. He kept his word, and on the third day after my interview I received a note announcing my promotion to the rank of commander i was delighted with his good fortune as was general o'brien and celeste when at the admiralty i inquired about o'brien and found that he was expected home every day he had gained great reputation in the east indies was chief in command at the taking of some of the islands and it was said was to be created a baronet for his services everything wore a fashionable respect except the disappearance of my sister this was a weight on my mind i could not remove but I have forgotten to inform the reader by what means General O'Brien and Celeste arrived so opportunely in England. Martinique had been captured by our forces about six months before, and the whole of the garrison surrendered as prisoners of war. General O'Brien was sent home and allowed to be on parole, although born a Frenchman, he had very high connections in Ireland, of whom Lord Belmore was one. When they arrived, they had made every inquiry for me without success. They knew that I had been tried by a court-martial and dismissed my ship, but after that, no clue could be found for my discovery. Celeste, who was fearful that some dreadful accident had occurred to me, had suffered very much in health, and General O'Brien, perceiving how much his daughter's happiness depended upon her attachment for me, had made up his mind that if I were found, we should be united. I hardly need to say how delighted he was when he discovered me, though, in a situation so little to be envied. The story of my incarceration of the action to be brought against my uncle and the reports of foul play relative to the succession had, in the meantime, been widely circulated among the nobility, and I found that every attention was paid me and I was repeatedly invited out as an object of curiosity and speculation. The loss of my sister also was a subject of much interest, and many people from good will made every inquiry to discover her. I had returned one day from the solicitors, who had advised for her in the newspapers without success, when I found a letter for me on the table in an admiralty enclosure. I opened it. The enclosure was one from O'Brien, who had just cast anchor at Spithead, and who had requested that the letter should be forwarded to me if any one could tell my address. My dear Peter, where are and what has become of you? I have received no letters for these two years, and I have fretted myself to death. I received your letter about the rascally court-martial, but perhaps you have not heard if the little scoundrel is dead. Yes, Peter, he brought your letter out in his own ship, and that was his death warrant. I met him at a private party. He brought up your name. I allowed him to abuse you, and then I told him that he was a liar and a scoundrel, upon which he challenged me, very much against his will, but the affront was so public that he could not help himself, upon which I shot him with all the good will in the world and could he have jumped up again twenty times like jack in the box i would have shot him every time the dirty scoundrel but there's the end of him 
Nobody pitied him, for everyone hated him, and the admiral only looked grave, and then was very much obliged to me for giving him a vacancy for his nephew. By the by, from some unknown hand, but I presume from the officers of his ship, I received a packet of correspondence between him and your worthy uncle, which is about as elegant a piece rascality as ever was carried on between two scoundrels. But that's not all, Peter. I have a young woman for you who will make your heart glad. Not Mademoiselle Celeste, for I don't know where she is, but the wet nurse who went out to India. Her husband was sent home as an invalid, and she was allowed her passage home with him in my frigate. Finding that she belonged to the regiment, I talked to her about one O'Sullivan who married in Ireland, and mentioned the girl's name, and when he discovered that she was a countryman of mine, he told me that his real name was O'Sullivan, sure enough, but that he had always served as O'Connell, and that his wife on board was the young woman in question, upon which I sent to speak to her, and telling her that I knew all about it, and mentioning the names of Ella Flangan and her mother, who had been given me the information, she was quite astonished and when I asked her what had become of the child which she took in place of her own, she told me that it had been drowned at Plymouth, and that her husband was saved at the time by a young officer, whose name I have here, says she, and then she pulled out of her neck your card with Peter Simple on it. Now, says I, do you know, good woman, that in helping on the rascally exchange the children, you ruin that very young man who saved your husband, for you deprive him of his title and property? She stared like a struck pig when I said so, and then cursed and blamed herself, and declared she'd write you as soon as we came home, and most anxious she is still to do so, for she loves the very name of you. So you see, Peter, a good action has its reward sometimes in this world, and a bad action also, seeing as how I've shot that confounded villain who dared to ill-use you. I have plenty more to say to you, Peter, but I don't like writing what perhaps may never be read. So I'll wait till I hear from you, and then, as soon as I get through my business, we will set to and trounce that scoundrel of an uncle. I have twenty thousand pounds jammed together in the consolidated, besides the Spice Islands, which will be a pretty penny, and every farthing of it shall go to right you, Peter, and make a lord of you, as I promised you often that you should be, and if you win, you shall pay, and if you don't, then damn the luck and damn the money too. I beg you will offer my best regards to Miss Ellen, and say how happy I shall be to hear that she is well. But it has always been on my mind, Peter, that your father did not leave too much behind him, and I wish to know how you both got on. I left you a carte blanche at my agent's, and I only hope that you have taken advantage of it if required. If not, you're not the Peter that I left behind me. So now, farewell, and don't forget to answer my letter in no time. Ever yours, Terence O'Brien. This was indeed joyful intelligence. I handed the letter to General O'Brien, who read it. Celeste hanging over his shoulder and perusing it at the same time. This is well, said the general. Peter, I wish you joy, and Celeste, I ought to wish you joy also at your future prospects. It will indeed be gratification if ever I hail you as lady privilege. Celeste, said I, you did not reject me when I was penniless and in disgrace. Oh, my poor sister Ellen, if I could find but you, how happy should I be. I sat down to write to O'Brien, acquainting him with what had occurred, and the loss of my dear sister. The day after the receipt of my letter, O'Brien burst into the room after moments of the congratulation were passed. He said, My heart's broken, Peter, about your sister Ellen. Find her I must. I shall give up my ship, for I'll never give up the search. As long as I live, I must find her. Do pray, my dear O'Brien, and, and I only wish— Wish what, Peter? Shall I tell you what I wish? that if I find her, you'll give her to me for my trouble. We then turned around to General O'Brien and Celeste. Captain O'Brien, said the General. Sir Terence O'Brien, if you please, General. His Majesty has given me a handle to my name. I congratulate you, Sir Terence, said the General, shaking him by the hand. What I was about to say is that I hope you will take your quarters in this hotel, and we will all live together. I trust that we will soon find Ellen. In the meantime, we have no time to lose in our exposure of Lord Privilege. Is the woman in town? Yes, and under lock and key. But the devil fear of her. Millions would not bribe her to wrong him who risked his life for her husband. She's Irish, General, to the backbone. Nevertheless, Peter, we must go to our solicitor to give the intelligence that he may take the necessary steps. For three weeks, O'Brien was diligent in his search for Ellen, employing every description of emissary without success. In the meantime, the general and I were prosecuting our cause against Lord Privilege. One morning, Lord Belmore called us and asked the general if he would accompany him to the theatre to see two celebrated pieces performed. 
in the latter which was a musical farce a new performer was to come out of whom report spoke highly celeste consented and after an early dinner we joined his lordship in his private box which was above the stage on the first tier the first piece was played and celeste who had never seen the performance of young was delighted the curtain then drew up for the second piece in the second act the new performer miss henderson was led by the manager on the stage she was apparently much frightened and excited but three rounds of applause gave her courage and she proceeded at the very first notes of her voice i was startled and o'brien who was behind threw himself forward to look at her but as we were almost directly above and her head was turned the other way we could not distinguish her features as she proceeded in her song she gained courage and her face was turned towards us and she cast her eyes up saw me the recognition was mutual i held up my arm but could not speak she staggered and fell down in a swoon tis ellen cried o'brien rushing past me and making one spring down on the stage she carried her off before any other person could come to her assistance i followed him and found him with ellen still in his arms and the actress assisting in her recovery the manager came forward to apologize stating that the young lady was too ill to proceed and the audience who had witnessed the behaviour of o'brien and myself were satisfied with the romance in real life which had been exhibited her part was read by another but the piece was little attended to every one trying to find out the occasion of this uncommon occurrence in the meantime ellen was put into a hackney coach by o'brien and me and we drove to the hotel where we were soon joined by the general and celeste End of chapter sixty four chapter sixty five of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anthony gurgis peter simple by frederick marriott chapter sixty five it never rains but it pours whether it be good or bad news i succeed in everything and to everything my wife my title and my estate and all's well that ends well i shall pass over the scenes which followed and give my sister's history in her own words i wrote to you my dear peter to tell you that i had considered it my duty to pay all my father's debts with your money and that there were but sixty pounds left when every claim had been satisfied and i requested you to come to me as soon as you could that i might have your counsel and assistance as to my future arrangements i received your letter ellen and was hastening to you when but no matter and i will tell you my story afterwards day after day i waited with anxiety for a letter and then wrote to the officers of the ship to know if any accident had occurred i received an answer from the surgeon informing me that you had quitted portsmouth to join me and had not since been heard of you may imagine my distress at this communication as i did not doubt but that something dreadful had occurred as i know too well that nothing would have detained you from me at such a time the new vicar appointed had come down to look over the house and to make arrangements for bringing in his family the furniture he had previously agreed to take at a valuation and the sum had been appropriated in liquidation of our father's debts i had already been permitted to remain longer than was usual and had no alternative but to quit which i did not do until the last moment i could not leave my address for i knew not where i was to go i took my place in the coach and arrived in london my first object was to secure the means of livelihood by offering myself as a governess but i found great difficulties from not being able to procure a good reference and from not having already served in that capacity at last i was taken into a family to bring up three little girls but i soon found out how little chance i had of comfort the lady had objected to me as too good-looking for the same reason the gentleman insisted upon my being engaged thus i was a source of disunion the lady treated me with great harshness and the gentleman with too much attention at last her ill-treatment and his persecution were both so intolerable that i gave notice that i should leave my situation i beg your pardon miss ellen but will you oblige me with the name and residence of that gentleman said o'brien indeed ellen do no such thing replied i continue your story at last i was engaged as a teacher to a school i had better have taken a situation as a housemaid i was expected to be everywhere to do everything was up at daylight and never in bed till past midnight fared very badly and was equally ill-paid but still it was honest employment and i remained there for more than a year but though as economical as possible my salary would not maintain me in clothes and washing which was all i required 
There was a master of elocution who came every week and whose wife was the teacher of music. They took a great liking to me and pointed out how much better I should be off if I could succeed on the stage, of which they had no doubt. For months I refused, hoping still to have some tidings of you, but at last my drudgery became so insupportable and my means so decreased that I unwillingly consented. It was then nineteen months since I had heard of you, and I mourned you as dead. I had no relations except my uncle, and I was unknown even to him. I quitted the situation and took up my abode with the teacher of elocution and his wife, who treated me with every kindness and prepared me for my new career. Neither at school, which was three miles from London, nor at my new residence, which was over Westminster Bridge, did I ever see a newspaper. It was no wonder, therefore, that I did not know of your advertisements. After three months' preparation, I was recommended and introduced to the manager by my kind friends and accepted. You know the rest. Well, Miss Ellen, if anyone ever tells you that you were on the stage, at all events, you may reply that you wasn't there long. My sister had been with us about three days, during which I had informed her of all that had taken place, when, one evening, finding myself alone with her, I candidly stated to her what were O'Brien's feelings towards her, and pleaded his cause with all the earnestness in my power. "'My dear brother,' replied she, "'I have always admired Captain O'Brien's character, and always have felt grateful to him for his kindness and attachment to you. But I cannot say that I love him. I have never thought about him, except as one whom we are both much indebted. But do you mean to say that you could not love him? No, I do not, and I will do all I can, Peter. I will try. I never will, if possible, make him unhappy who has been so kind to you. Depend upon it, Ellen, that with your knowledge of O'Brien and with feelings of gratitude towards him, you will soon love him, if once you accept him as a suitor. May I tell him? You may tell him that he may plead his own cause, my dear brother, and, at all events, I will listen to no other until he has had fair play, but recollect that at present I only like him, like him very much, it is true, but still, I only like him. I was quite satisfied with my success, and so was O'Brien when I told him. By the powers, Peter, she's an angel, and I can't expect her to love an inferior being like myself. But if she'll only like me well enough to marry me, I'll trust to after marriage for the rest. O'Brien, having thus obtained permission, certainly lost no time in taking advantage of it. Celeste and I were more fondly attached every day. The solicitor declared my case so good that he could raise fifty thousand pounds upon it. In short, all our causes were prosperous. When an event occurred, the details of which, of course, I did not obtain until some time afterwards, but which I shall narrate here. My uncle was very much alarmed when he discovered that I had been released from Bedlam, still more so when he had notice given him of a suit relative to the succession to the title. His emissaries had discovered that the wet nurse had been brought home in O'Brien's frigate and was kept so close that they could not communicate with her. He now felt that all his schemes would prove abortive. His legal adviser was with him when they had been walking in the garden, talking over the contingencies, when they stopped close to the drawing-room windows of the mansion at Eagle Park. "'But, sir,' observed the lawyer, "'if you will not confide in me, I cannot act for your benefit. You still assert that nothing of the kind has taken place?' "'I do,' replied his lordship. "'It is a foul invention.' Uh, then, my lord, may I ask why you considered it advisable to imprison Mr. Simple in Bedlam? Because I hate him, retorted the lordship, detest him. And for what reason, my lord? His character is unimpeached, and he is your near relative. I tell you, sir, that I hate him. Would that he were now lying dead at my feet. Hardly were the words out of my uncle's mouth when a whizzing was heard for a second, and then something fell down within a foot of where they stood with a heavy crash. They started, turned round, the adopted heir lay lifeless at their feet, and their legs were besplattered with blood in his brains. The poor boy, seeing his lordship below, had leaned out of one of the upper windows to call to him, but lost his balance, and had fallen head foremost upon the wide stone pavement which surrounded the mansion. For a few seconds, the lawyer and my uncle looked upon each other with horror. "'A judgment! A judgment!' cried the lawyer at last, looking at his client. My uncle covered his face with his hands and fell. Assistance now came up, but there was more than one to help up. The violence of his emotion had brought on an apoplectic fit, and my uncle, although he breathed, never spoke again. 
It was in consequence of this tragic event, of which we did not know the particulars until afterwards, that the next morning my solicitor called and put a letter into my hand, saying, Allow me to congratulate your lordship. We were all at breakfast at the time, and the General O'Brien and myself jumped up, all in astonishment at this unexpected title being so soon conferred upon me, that we had a heavy bill for damages to pay, and had not Ellen caught the tea urn as it has tipped over, there would, in all probability, have been a doctor's bill into the bargain. The letter was eagerly read. It was from my uncle's legal adviser, who had witnessed the catastrophe, informing me that all dispute as to the succession was at an end by the tragical event that had taken place, and that he had put seals upon everything awaiting my arrival or instructions. The solicitor, as he presented the letter, said that he would take his leave and call again in an hour or two, when I was more composed. My first movement, when I had read the letter aloud, was to throw my arms round Celeste and embrace her, and O'Brien, taking the hint, did the same to Ellen, and was excused in consideration of circumstances. But as soon as she could disengage herself, her arms were intertwined round my neck, while Celeste was hanging on her father's. Having disposed of the ladies, the gentlemen now shook hands, and although we had not all appetites to finish our breakfast, never was there a happier quintet. In about an hour, my solicitor returned and congratulated me, and immediately set about the necessary preparations. I desired him to go down immediately to Eagle Park, attend to the funeral of my uncle and the poor little boy, who had paid so dearly for his intended advancement, and take charge from my uncle's legal adviser, who remained in the house. The dreadful accidents in high life found its way into the papers of the day, and before dinner time, a pile of visiting cards was poured in, which covered the table. The next day, a letter arrived from the First Lord, announcing that he had made out my commission as post-captain, and trusted that I would allow the pleasure of presenting it himself at the dinner hour, at half-past seven. Very much obliged to him, the fool of the family might have waited a long while for it. While I was reading this letter, the waiter came up to say that a young woman below wanted to speak to me. I desired her to be shown up. As soon as she came in, she burst into tears, knelt down, and kissed my hand. Sure! it's you oh yes it's you that saved my poor husband when i was assisting to your ruin and aren't i punished for my wicked doings aren't my poor boy dead she said no more but remained on her knees sobbing bitterly of course the reader recognizes in her that the wet nurse who had exchanged her child i raised up and desired her to apply to my solicitor to pay her expenses and leave her address but do you forgive me mr simple it's not that i have forgiven myself I do forgive you with all my heart, my good woman. You have been punished enough. I have indeed, replied she, sobbing. But don't I deserve it all? And more too. God's blessing and all the saints too upon your head, and your kind forgiveness anyhow. My heart is lighter. And she quitted the room. She scarcely quitted the hotel when the waiter came up again. Another lady, my lord, wishes to speak to you, but she won't give her name really my lord you seem to have an extensive female acquaintance said the general at all events i am not aware of any that i need to be ashamed of show the lady up waiter in a moment entered a fat unwieldy little mortal very warm from walking she sat down in a chair threw back her tippet and then exclaimed lord bless you how you've grown gemini if i can hardly believe my eyes and i declare he don't know me I really cannot exactly recollect where I had the pleasure of seeing you before, madam. Well, that's what I said to Jemima when I went down into the kitchen. Jemima, says I, I wonder if little Peter Simple will know me. And Jemima says, I think he would the parrot, marm. Miss Handicock, I believe, said I, recollecting Jemima and the parrot, although from a thin little woman she had grown so fat as to not be recognizable. Oh, so you found me out, Mr. Simple. My lord, I ought to say, well, I need not ask after your grandfather now, for I know he's dead. But as I was coming this way for orders, I thought I would just step in and see how you looked. I trust Mr. Handicock is well, ma'am. Pray, is he a bull or a bear? Lord bless you, Mr. Simple. My lord, I should say. He's been neither bull nor bear for these three years. He was obliged to waddle. If I didn't know much about bulls and bears, I know very well what a lame duck is to my cost. We're off to the stock exchange, and Mr. Handicock is set up as a coal merchant. Indeed. Yes, that is, we have no coals, but we take orders and have half a crown of children for our trouble. As Mr. Handicock says, it's a very good business if you only had enough for it. 
perhaps your lordship may be able to give us an order it's nothing out of your pocket and something into ours i shall be very happy when i return again to town mrs handycock i hope that the parrot is quite well oh my lord that's a sore subject only think of mr handycock when we retired from the change taking my parrot one day and selling it for five guineas saying five guineas was better than a nasty squalling bird to be sure there was nothing for dinner that day but as jemima agreed with me we'd rather have gone without a dinner for a month than have parted with paul since we've looked up a little in the world i saved up five guineas by hook or by crook and tried to get paul back again but the lady said she wouldn't take fifty guineas for him mrs handycock then jumped from her chair saying good morning my lord i'll leave one of mr handycock's cards jemima would be so glad to see you as she left the room celeste laughingly asked me whether i had any more such acquaintances i replied that i believed not but i must acknowledge that mrs trotter was brought to my recollection and i was under some alarm lest she should come and pay her respects the next day i had another unexpected visit we had just sat down for dinner when i heard a disturbance below and shortly after the general's french servant came up in great haste saying there was a foreigner below who wished to see me and that he had been caning one of the waiters of the hotel for not paying him proper respect who can that be thought i and i went out of the door and looked over the banisters as the noise still continued you must not come here to be englishmen i can tell you roared one of the waiters who do we care for your foreign courts sacre canet cried the other party in a contemptuous tone which i well knew ay canal we'll duck you in the canal if you don't mind ye will said the stranger who had hitherto spoken french allow me to observe in the most delicate manner in the world just to hint that you are a damned treacherous scraping napkin carrying shilling seeking up and down the stairs son of a bitch and take this for your impudence the noise of the cane was again heard and i hastened downstairs where i found count shuskin thrashing two or three of the waiters without mercy at my appearance the waiters who were showing fight retreated to a short distance out of reach of the cane my dear count exclaimed i is it you and i shook him by the hand my dear lord privilege will you excuse me but these fellows are saucy then i'll have them discharged replied i if a friend of mine and an officer of your rank and distinguish cannot come to see me without insult i will seek another hotel this threat of mine and the reception i gave the count put all to rights the waiter sneaked off and the master of the hotel apologized it appeared that they had desired him to wait in the coffee-room until they could announce him which had hurt the count's dignity we are sitting down to dinner count will you join us as soon as i have improved my toilette my dear lord replied he you must perceive that i am off a journey the master of the hotel bowed and proceeded to show the count to a dressing-room when i returned upstairs what was the matter inquired o'brien oh nothing a little disturbance in consequence of a foreigner not understanding english in about five minutes the waiter opened the door and announced count chuckson now o'brien you'll be puzzled said i and in came the count my dear lord privilege said he coming up and taking me by the hand let me not be the last to congratulate you on your accession i was running up the channel in my frigate when a pilot boat gave me the newspaper in which i saw your unexpected change of circumstances i made an excuse for dropping my anchor at spithead this morning and i have come up post to express how sincerely i participate in your good fortune count shuckson then politely saluted the ladies and the general and turned round to o'brien who had been staring at him with astonishment count shuckson allow me to introduce sir terence o'brien by the piper that played before moses but it's a puzzle said o'brien earnestly looking in the count's face blood and thunder if it ain't chucks my dear fellow when did you rise from your grave fortunately replied the count as they took each other's hand for some time i never went into it mr therese but now with your permission my lord i'll take some food as i really am not a little hungry after dinner captain o'brien you shall hear my history his secret was confided to the whole party upon my pledging myself for their keeping it locked up in their own breasts which was a bold thing on my part considering that two of them were ladies the count stayed with us for some time and was introduced by me everywhere it was impossible to discover that he had not been bred up in a court 
His manners were so good, he was a great favourite with the ladies, and his mustachios, bad French, and waltzing, an accomplishment he had picked up in Sweden, were quite the vogue. All the ladies were sorry when the Swedish count announced his departure by a PPC. Before I left town, I called upon the First Lord of the Admiralty and procured for Swinburne a first-rate building, that is to say, ordered to be built. This he had often said he wished, as he was tired of the sea after a service of forty-five years. Subsequently, I obtained leave of absence for him every year, and he used to make himself very happy at Eagle Park. Most of his time was, however, passed on the lake, either fishing or rowing about, telling long stories to all who would join him in his water excursions. A fortnight after my assuming my title, we set off for Eagle Park, and Celeste consented to my entreaties that the wedding should take place that day month. Upon this hint, O'Brien spoke, and to oblige me, Ellen consented that we should be united on the same day. O'Brien wrote to Father McGrath, but the letter was returned by post with dead marked upon the outside. O'Brien then wrote to one of his sisters, who informed him that Father McGrath would cross the bog one evening, when he had taken a very large proportion of whiskey and that he was seen out of the right path and had never been heard of afterwards on the day appointed we were all united and both unions have been attended with as much happiness as the world can afford both o'brien and i are blessed with children which as o'brien observed have come upon us like old age until we now can muster a large christmas party in the two families the general's head is white and he sits and smiles happy in his daughter's happiness and in the gambols of his grandchildren such reader is the history of peter simple viscount privilege no longer the fool but the head of the family who now bids you farewell end of chapter sixty five and the end of peter simple by frederick marriott